Welcome back to Misunderstood. This is Rachel Yucatel. Okay, this week we're doing things a little bit different. We are separating one interview into two parts because the conversation was just flowing. It was so good. This guest was literally one of my favorite guests I've ever had on the show. It's kind of why I started a podcast so that I'm able to speak with people like him. I have an interview today with Lee Asher from the Asher House Animal Sanctuary. Uh, If you don't follow him already on Instagram, you should. It's the Asher House and he rescues animals and has a sanctuary in Oregon and is just like the most amazing guy ever. So today we are releasing part one. Tune in on Wednesday for part two. Make sure you listen to both because everything he says is so interesting. If you're a pet lover, you're going to love this episode. If you're not, maybe you'll become one. So definitely please, please listen to this episode. I think it's really important for anyone who cares about animals in general, especially dogs, because we talk so much about dogs. So thanks for listening. And here is my exciting part one with Lee Asher. Welcome back to Misunderstood. I'm your host, Rachel Yucatel. My next guest, Lee Asher, is one of the most inspirational people I've ever come across. He founded the Asher House, an animal sanctuary, which on Instagram, over 1 million people are currently following Lee on his journey, rescuing and rehabilitating animals that have been abused and abandoned, giving them a permanent home to live out their lives. Here to tell his story is the one and only Lee Asher. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you deeply for having me. It means a lot. Thank you. So let's start with not who you are now, but how you became who you are. Tell me about your childhood, where you're from, what that was like for you growing up. Wow. Um, I actually grew up in Florida, which I just found out you're, you're there now. So I grew up in Florida. Yeah. Um, like, like many people, which is important to recognize, I had a very unique childhood. Um, I grew up with severe learning disabilities. So in school, I had to be separated from all the cool kids and pretty much everyone who had groups of friends and cliques and athletes. I grew up with severe learning disabilities, ADD and ADHD and all these things. And um, I spent most of my time, the majority of my time either alone or with animals. I didn't have many friends or many people to go to uh, for, for really anything. And I always wanted to fit in. I was, it's not that I didn't care. I wanted to fit in. I wanted to be part of a group. I wanted friends, but I never felt not only welcomed, even if I was welcomed, I didn't feel comfortable. I felt just the, mo- at mo- the most at peace if I was either alone or with animals. And not to fast forward, but by learning that, that's kind of how my journey started. You know, I really accepted accepted the fact that at a young age that I was different and I stopped trying to fit in, which brought me a lot of happiness by just being comfortable to um, accept the fact that I was very different, mm-hmm. you know? And I started going to animal shelters as often as I could. I, uh, I would even run away from school sometimes there was a there was an animal shelter about a mile down the road from where I where I went to school and I would go there during lunch and breaks I would go there all of the time they would they thought I was luckily I've always been very tall for my age I always looked older so they thought I was you know an adult but I was quite young and I would go and I would just sit with the animals and I used to bring them food from my cafeteria and treats and um yeah it was it was just different you know, I, I can't explain it. You know, I, I look back at my childhood often now, like I always look back at that little boy. And it's interesting that I don't feel I'm much different now. Hmm. Besides, you know, the insecurity aspect, I was, of course, very, very insecure. Um, pretty much throughout my entire, even up until my young adult life, until my mid 20s, very, very insecure, very lost. I never understood what I was doing here. And a lot of the questions I asked myself, as a little boy, as you know, just a kid, I still ask myself today. I just, it, it's interesting. I, I'm doing what I always envisioned I would do, but my mindset isn't much different. Right. So did your parents get you a pet of your own or you had to go and volunteer to go see other animals? You know, it was really sad because I, I had a pet and I became, 
I, I became allergic to dogs and um, allergic to anything with fur. I had severe allergies. I was always sick as well. And looking back at it, it was definitely because of stress. My parents were always screaming at each other. They were very, very loud and very negative about everything. And it was, uh, you know, they're, they're still alive. So I always feel a little bit of guilt when I talk about it. Hmm. But it was just a really, really just an unfortunate way for a child to view a relationship which really messed me up up until honestly recently you know thinking of what a relationship should look like and sound like and it was just awful so looking back at why I was always sick and I had like severe scoliosis when I would go to school I had to wear this huge back brace so imagine being a kid with learning disabilities with a back brace tall can't defend himself so like I was just this tool to get to get bullied and I finally had a dog and it was like the most amazing thing. And then they took the dog away from me because I became allergic. I was allergic to everything. I mean, you name it. <laughs> and I was allergic to it. Like I remember begging for a rabbit and I couldn't have the rabbit. So eventually by going, as I mentioned earlier, I would go to these animals and I, I, I gotta tell you, I, I kind of feel a little bit guilty because I'm, I'm acting like I had it so terrible, but I, I, everything that I went through without a doubt has shaped me to what I'm able to do now and to have the compassion I have for not just animals, but people. Yeah. So as I talk about my childhood, I, I want you to know that I really don't regret a thing. And I also know, um, not regret, I wouldn't change a thing, excuse me. But I also know that my parents, understanding who they are now, really did their, the best that they could at the time. They really were doing their best and in their minds you know, we're the best parents in the world. So I, I just wanted to say that, but um, what, by, by, go, by ignoring the fact that I was allergic to dogs and going to the animal shelters, I felt, I think that I built a strong enough immune system to where I, I wasn't allergic anymore. And eventually I was able to get a dog, yeah. Oh, wow. That's amazing. I think what you said was so important because so many people look back on their lives and they have a lot of regrets or guilt or shame or they feel really bad about their childhood and want to change it so much. But I think it's so important for people to realize that that shapes who you are. And unless you have lows or things to, you know, compare to what's good, you don't know the difference. Like there's such a pendulum. You, you have to be able to feel, you know, the negative to be able to feel the positive. And it's such a great thing for people to realize that who you are is shaped by where you came from and you can just learn a bunch of lessons and um, you, sh you, it's okay to, to kind of be in it and know that that's shaped who you are and you're a better person for it instead of wishing it was different. Right. I mean, that's how I feel. Yeah. I mean, you nailed it. I, I, if you could correct me, I forgot what you said, but in order for, can you repeat that one part in order to know oh. how to be so positive? Say yeah, I, I see things. I actually have a tattoo down my spine of it that says, uh, without pain, happiness has no meaning. And I believe in yeah. the pendulum. So, so like, you bring up a beautiful point, you know, um, I have this, you know, I, I go to therapy and, and I, I, I really invest in my mental health and no one's been a, a, ever been able to help me look at what I'm about to tell you in a positive light up until a couple of days ago. I have a personal trainer. And um, he said to me, he, he was making a joke. He said, you know, my mother-in-law father follows you on Instagram. She asked me if you were single. So I said, he, and he, he asked me like, if that happens a lot and stuff like that. And I said, you know, it's interesting. People get this image of me on social media, but they don't know how toxic it is to date me, mm. how, how, how toxic it is. And he said, what are you, he's like, what are you talking about? He's like, I, you're the nicest guy I've ever met. I love training you. He, if I had a daughter, you know, he has a son. If I had a daughter, I don't think I could want her to date anyone else but you. Uh -huh. And I said, his name is Rod. I said, Rod, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll, I could be in the room with someone and I think about something negative and I create like nothing, nothing at all happens. But all of a sudden I become completely cold and shut off. And I said, I could be at a restaurant and I could hear someone speaking badly about someone. And you would think that they were talking to me. I said, I take on everyone's energy and I become this, this toxic person. And of course, since nothing happened, the person in the room thinks that they did something wrong. Mm. And the more they push to try to figure out what they did wrong, 
the more upset and closed off I get. And I said, it's, I said, it's such a terrible trait that, you know, I, I feel so bad for the people in my life. And you know what he said to me? He said, Lee, he said, you're the most giving person. Like he, cause I'm with him two hours every morning. So he hears me on the phone. He, if he needs a favor, you know, I, I, I'm, he hear, he knows me very well. And he said, I'm so glad to hear you say this because I was wondering like, what's, there's got to be something wrong with him. And he said, but there's nothing wrong with you. He said, I believe in order to be as good as you are, you also have to be bad. Mm. Like you also have to be low. And he said, for you to jump really high, what do you have to do? You have to crouch down low to the floor. Mm. And it was such a, such, and you know, he explained it better, but it was such a beautiful way to, for me to view it as if like, may, like, you know, a, I can go really good, really high, but in order to get really high, you have to go really low sometimes, you know? And it's uh, it's true. I believe the most amount of growth is in the struggle. There is no life without pain. Mm. It teaches us the most beautiful things in the world, you know? It like, it, 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 it just, it's when you know how to, when you know that pain is happening for you and not happening to you, which is a really hard thing to understand, when you're able to embrace it and know that it's 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 for you, like this is, I believe my personal belief that anything that happens to us in our life is so that we can make another life better. Mm. I believe that no matter what you go through, it's not for you. It's for you to use that energy, that tool, that wisdom, that experience. It's for you to use that to help another person mm. in some way. And then that person uses that and that person, and that is the gift of life. That is why we are, we all, everyone's looking for their purpose. We all have the same purpose. It's to help each other in some way. Right. We can all help each other in different ways, but that is your purpose. Mm. It's to help people. We all have it. I and I, I believe that to my core. And, you know, the people, I hear stories of what dogs go through, cats. I hear, I hear stories that, you know, really test me can can i believe in people again can i trust people again and it's like yes you can because this is so you can teach so that you can inspire this is not for you for you to for you to learn this and experience this and cl be closed off from it is the opposite of what the universe wants you to do with it you know right so in bringing up that point, you've talked a lot about how you had a fear of death when you were yeah. younger and the concept of uncertainty. Um, when did that start for you? And also, how did you figure your way out of that? So you changed your mentality on that fear. Wow, you're really good at this. My goodness. Um, I've done I'll, a lot I'll of never, research on you. <laughs> I'll never forget the story. And by the way, I know sometimes I could talk a lot. I'm not as sensitive as I once was. Never hesitate to interrupt me, okay? Okay. Please. I'm not going to interrupt you. Go ahead. I love it. But, but I don't mind if I'm rambling, you know. But I'll tell you the story. I was sitting on my mom. My parents watched a lot of news. You know, the news was always on on every TV in the house. The news was on. And I was sitting on my, my mom's bed while she was getting ready for work. And I had just been able to start talking and understanding things. And somebody died. I think it might have been Frank Sinatra, if I am not mistaken. But somebody died, and I asked my mom, how did they die? And she said, I, whatever she said, they just, they died, right? And I said, how can someone die like that? And she said, a lot of people die that way. And I said, how else do people die? And she said, you name it, you know? And then she said, she, you, she's like, Lee, you know that everybody dies, right? And I said, everybody dies? She said, everybody, I said, and then what happens? She's like, I don't know. <laughs> and like, when she said that, my world, I remember like feeling nothing but fear. And, and you know, again, she did the best that she could. But in, in that moment, instead of like comforting me and, and letting me know, you know, that it's about the journey and that life, you know, she was like, grow, grow up. Like everybody dies, you know, snap out of it. I'm going to work. It was very cold and quick. And I started just obsessing over the thought, you know, it, it, it brought me such anxiety. I used to just think about it and out loud, I'd say, no, 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 no. Like, don't think about it right now. You know, no, no, no. 
And I realized, you know, like, I, I think I really had that fear up until I kind of found my purpose. That, that, that's really what took it away. It was finding, figuring out why I was here. Because then it doesn't matter to me what happens after you die. It matters to me what happens while I'm alive. Right. You know? Right. That's and, and, th and that changed my whole perspective. It's like f f finding the Asher house, creating the community. Um, and also, to be honest, and not the most, this is what I'm about to say is I'm very positive or optimistic, but it's the truth. As you get, for me, as, being so invested into animal rescue, you know, you can go to the shelter without really knowing much about animal rescue. You just know about the dog. But with what I do now, finding so much about how cruel people can be, how unfair life can be, I started thinking to myself that death can't be that way. That, th that I am more curious, you know, about what would happen. Instead of fearing it, I'm more curious because I don't think anything in the world would be as unfair or, how, or as cruel as how life can be. Now, I also believe that life can be beautiful and peaceful and all this, but I think what I, I now have the belief where my feeling, my answer is not the unknown, that I believe there's a peace to it. And that's why it's so important, you know, to do your best to find that peace here and do your best to make it count. But I don't think that that it will be that unfair once we're gone, if that makes sense. Absolutely. So, you know, I think that's so important what you're talking about, finding your purpose, because so many of us are lost, right? And even if we're chugging oh, yeah. along and doing what we think we're supposed to do and we, you know, find that partner or we have kids or we find a job, sometimes people are still really unhappy and they can't figure out why. And you oh, know, my God, yeah. I'm 48 years old and I'm doing my best to, you know, reinvent my life all the time and figure it out because I've realized that that sense of being unhappy is because I haven't found a purpose. Do you know what I mean? And so I'm constantly mm. trying to figure it out. I think it's the, the first step is for your second act of life kind of, or even getting to that point where you feel like your life has started is finding that purpose. And for a lot of people, it's really hard, but it sounds like for you at some point you were able to figure out your purpose. And um, so I want to get into that because that's where you kind of flourish and become someone new, even though you're talking about being the same person, but it's when it, your life started. Sure. So you quit your job, you traveled in an RV across the country, to rescue animals. And I want to know what that was like. What were you doing as a job to begin with that you quit? Yeah, I was working in a, for a finance company where I would go to different sales companies and help them with like motivation and sales strategies to, you know, increase optimization and to, to be more motivated, you know, talk to them about energy and health. A lot of what I talk about now but I would do it, you know, for a corporate company and go in there. They, they would call me a uh, corporate trainer. But the truth is, you know, it's can I curse on here or no? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it was bullshit. You know, I didn't know at all how to train a company. I never owned a business. I was just up. I was just a tall guy who looked good in a suit who can who can reiterate words from other people. You know, it's all about motivate. But I didn't know anything about it. I felt like such a phony. Hmm. You know, it wasn't you, from your experience, right? It was no, just exactly. you read and I believed it. it. It's not that I didn't believe it. I believed, you know, you need to be healthy and you need to work hard and go, 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 all these things. But you shouldn't ever speak about something unless you experience it. You should never ask, ask somebody how to start a business or how to run a business if he's never or she's never done those things, mm -hmm. you know? So I was just a phony. I was so tired of being a phony. I was so tired of being like everybody else. I was so tired of not going, starting my own path, my own way. We, the only reason I'm bringing this up is because you were, you, you mentioned death. I thought a lot about death and it's like, what, what's this thought that you're going to live another 10 years? What's this thought that you're going to live another five years? You don't know shit. You don't know, you don't know what the fuck is going to happen tonight. You know, I said, do, do, what, what, what do you love to do, Lee Asher? What do you love to do? I said, I love to help people. What else do you love to do? I said, I love to help animals. Fucking go do it. Go, go figure out how to do that. 
those are the two things that you don't need to make money from to be happy. Go do that and nothing else. And that became my obsession to figure those things out. How, how do I do that? You know? And the answer was right in front of me because I had, you know, I was at the shelter and I was making videos um, of animals and people loved the videos at the time. And, and, you know, it was getting animals adopted. So I said, I'm doing, why don't I do this? You know, how do I take it to the next level? And the next one, I kept thinking like, okay, this, this I can only take this to here, right? The, to this level. What, what can I do now to take it to the next one? And that's what I kept focusing on is the next the next level, which I'm sure I could tell you're someone who has really high standards because you talked about your purpose, which I think you do such a good job at this. So you obviously have really high standards. So people with high standards, it's much harder for them to find their purpose, right? Because you'll find your purpose. You say, no, no, it's, that can't be it. Yeah. <laughs> it has to be, it has to be this, it has to be that, right? But a lot of times our purpose is just that, is just doing that little bit of good you know, you, you, that, that one person's life that you saved, that, that was it. You continue on that path, not that you retire, but you just keep, but anyways, I, I knew for me, like I had to leave it all behind. Mm -hmm. I, I had to leave it all behind. Right. And so what was that yeah. like? Literally quitting your job, not knowing where your income was going to come from. Oh, and my, how did you do it? Of, I was just thinking about this this morning. I, I seriously, Rachel, I was just thinking about this. I was at the gym and I was, I was having a hard time with my workout. And sometimes when I'm having a hard time, what I do is I think of harder times. Mm -hmm. So whenever I'm having a hard time, I think of a time that was harder for me that I got through it. And that always helps me with the hard time, mm -hmm. which is a, you know, a, a really good strategy. So I was thinking about the day that I told my mentor, my plan is, his name is Al. He lives in Palm Beach. And I, I, this is the only guy who I felt ever thought I'd be successful, right? There was one guy who thought I'd be successful and it was, you know, very successful guy. And I, his word meant everything to me. And I told him my plan and he said, for the first time ever, he called me stupid. Wow. He's like, wow, you're stupid. I said, no, don't say that. I remember he said, you know, I really believed in you, past tense. And now you're doing this. Because the way everyone would explain it, you're quitting, this is what everyone, you're quitting your job to travel with dogs in an RV. And it's like, you could say anything <laughs> with that tone and make it, I said, no, I'm going to visit, I'm going to go to different shelters. I'm going to visit shelters and get animals adopted. And I'm going to be able to teach people how to train rescue animals and how to build a bond. And, you know, I'm all, I'm passionate about it. And no, and I remember just like, you know, you feel so small, like you feel like, you know, I, I felt like how, like, just like back I did in those classes, you know, you so alone, so misunderstood, like nobody gets it, you know? And it's at that moment that you can decide. That is, that is a pivotal moment for your life, your career, your relationships. It's that moment where you say, okay, here's, here's the decision I have to make. I'm going to, to not, it's not about proving everyone wrong. It's about, am I going to prove to myself that I'm right? Or am I going to prove them that they're right? Right. You should never want to prove to them that they're wrong, right? Because now you have ego involved in your mission. Mm -hmm. There should never be ego involved in your mission. The battle is always within. Am I going to prove to myself that I'm right? And I was born with all these, you know, dyslexic and ADD and this and all that. Can't do math, can't do this. All, all because I'm supposed to do this with my life? Or am I going to show them that they were right? You see? And, and that was the moment. You know, I said, I'm going to do everything it takes. Like... And that's so and brave because it's so hard for people because so many people ask outside opinions, right? And that sways. No, 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 life. no, 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 no. You never, today, uh, somebody asked me my opinion on an invention that they want to create, right? Mm -hmm. And I said, will my opinion make a difference in whether or not you do it or not? And they said, I'm not sure. And I said, first decide if you're going to do it no matter what. Then ask me my opinion. Yeah. Right. That's a great answer. 
But that's right. such a great lesson that you're giving people on, you, you know, don't be swayed because somebody else is disappointed in your decision because ultimately right. you will feel disappointed if you don't follow your own path. I mean, that's why so many people are exactly. stuck. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. When they say the affirmation, which I love, all you need is within you now, right? That is because it is completely, you are the controller. The You are all of it, you know? You are everything that it, that you need to do what you need to do. You are everything that you, you need to be able to pivot, right? There's a difference, right? Let's say, for example, it's a basketball player who's obsessed with basketball. I have to play basketball. I have to play basketball. What that person needs to do is realize they don't have to play basketball, but they have to be involved in basketball. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to pivot. It has to, you have to love it so much that you're willing to let the universe eventually tell you, listen, you're, you, you literally don't have legs. You can't play basketball in the NBA, but you can be a hell of a fucking coach. Right. And that's what it's about. It's about not letting people tell you, but you understanding what you're able to do and what you're able to accomplish, but never taking your eyes off the main goal, right? Mm -hmm. It, it ha you have to have your eyes so laser focused on it. And I was lucky, you know, a lot of people tell me this, which they're right. Excuse me while I take my jacket off. A lot of people say it was easier for you to make this decision because you didn't have a wife or children. I, I did have a girlfriend at the time that, you know, I, I, I knew with where my head was at this, my focus was, was going to be my passion, but you know, it, when someone says, yeah, but I have kids, I have this, I have that. At the end of the day, these are all the reasons why you should do it. Yeah. Right. You know, when people tell me their reasoning of why they can't get to a certain, a certain point in their life or their career, they're telling me the reasons why they should. Right. They're telling me all the reasons why you should, you should be, even if you fail, you're teaching your kids that you went for it no matter what, you right. know, right. we have such a short window, Rachel. Like, if you think about it, right, it's not even if you lived to 100 years old, even if you live to 100 years old, in order to be a healthy operator as a human being, you have to get enough sleep, minimum seven, eight hours, right? You have to exercise minimum an hour. You have to eat right. So you have to plan that accordingly. You have to invest rest. You have to invest your, you know, whether it be meditation or cold or sauna, you have all of these things that you have to do to to be clear and focused you have such a short window to do something amazing mm. so we should never spend that time with reasons of why we're not doing it right you know everything should be to better your life to better by, by better you are an energy like like you have no control over that you are an unstoppable energy when you move energy moves with you you walk into a restaurant that energy is now formed with all these other energies you have a responsibility of, as a human being to be an unstoppable force for good, mm -hmm. right? And that's why everyone's so messed up right now because there's so much negative energy, so many people making bad decisions that your 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 kind of people are confused of which which direction they should go. Right. But you need to be laser focused on your mission. You need to be laser focused on your passion. You need to when, when you're doing that. You're, you, you don't judge others, you don't make fun of others, you don't put negative, you're, you're, you're too busy and you're too focused on being a force for good. Right. That should be everyone's rule, everyone's intention to be a force for good every day, you know? And it sounds like from what you're talking about, you really believe in the power of positivity and manifestation. And I know from doing some, you know, following you that you, when you set out on your journey, you had a vision board for yourself. Do you think yeah. that's important for people? Do you still have one? Do you still go by that mentality? I, 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 I don't have the actual board because in, in my mind, you know, now it's about maintaining, I, 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 I accomplished the entire board like literally from a to z the board is all checked off right so although i still have the board i don't go to it for vision i go to it to humble me mm. right to, but now it's all about maintaining the board making sure that the, the visions of the board don't fall off of course you know it's it's hard to get there but it's harder to maintain i can tell you that right, right. and 
And I, I think that people should use any sort of positive influence that helps them. I'll tell you what I don't like to see is people who have a vision board because they read it that it's good in a book. You have to have a vision board because you know that this, if you use it as a tool, not as artwork, yeah. right? That's why it's so important not to bullshit yourself because bullshitting yourself is a habit, mm. right? You buy the book that you never read. No, I don't believe, and I say this with absolute respect, you know, I know books change lives and movies change lives and motiva motivational speakers change lives, all that shit. But man, if you already know it. You already know what to do. You, you just have to apply it and apply it consistently. Right. No one can teach you consistency and no one can teach you discipline. Those are the two things, the two things that are going to get you where you need to go, whether it be uh, physical, you know, weight loss, weight gain, strength, whatever it be, consistency, discipline, whether it be money, consistency, discipline, a good relationship, a healthy relationship. You can't not, you can't wake up and stop giving a shit about your relationship one day. You have to consistently, you know, be a good partner, right? Be disciplined. All these things, it's an everyday thing. And once you lack either of those things, you realize you have to accept the fact that your mission is not that important to you. It's more people take on more hobbies than missions, I, I found. So one of the things on your vision board that you were talking about earlier was to go on Ellen and you mm -hmm. made that happen or it yeah. happened for you because so many people kept contacting her and saying, Lee Asher should be on your show. Tell yeah, me yeah, about what it was like to be on Ellen. It was a cool experience, you know, I, um, respectful, res with respectful to her, I, I don't think I would do it again. Mm -hmm. uh, I never said that before, but I think I did it and I, I don't, I don't see myself doing it again. So she, she's seen as like the queen of mean now for a little bit. Did she treat you like that? Or did you feel honored? No, there and no, she was very nice to me. She was very nice to me. And I, I can't comment on her work environment because, you know, they, from my experience, I, whatever I would have to say would be fabricated. You, they don't give you enough, you know, you're in a room by yourself, you're watching Ellen on the screen. And then they say, okay, now you're on Ellen, you know, so it, what I, I could, I could not comment on that, but. Um, it must have helped you and get, and gave you a lot of visibility. No. I, I, I thought it, I thought it was going to be more um, to me, you know, you know, what, you know what the best part about being on Ellen was it said, okay, you see, you could do it. Right. You've made it. It's just something to check off on your list. It's a guide. Yeah, to follow. I never, I, I wouldn't, I never, even today, I, I don't feel like I've made it, which I think because it happened to me later in my career, mm -hmm. you know, success didn't happen to, to me until my thirties. So I never felt like I made it. I know how hard it is, but when I made it on Ellen, it was like one of the further things down before a sanctuary. It was like the eighth thing on my list to to accomplish. And when I made it, I said, wow, you know, you're about to almost check everything off. You have, you have like two or three more things to check off, which I gave myself like five years to do, which, you know, because of COVID, I did it a lot shorter. Um, but that to me was like, you are on the right path, Lee. Goodness always prevails. You've made mistakes, you know, you have regrets in your business, you know, but you kept doing the right thing. And that, that's something that really the Ellen show taught me. Like I kept doing the right thing and I was able to get on that show. And that was really a beautiful, like stay on this direction type right. of thing. You know what I mean? Right. So talk, talk to us now. So you started in Florida, you get in an RV, you start driving across country. Did you know you were going towards Oregon or did you? No, no I, 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 didn't, I didn't. I started in Cal. So I, I grew up in Florida, Oh, okay. but I grew up in Florida, but with that job I told you about, it would require me to live in a different city and state every three to four months. Mm. So I hadn't been back to Florida in quite some time, and still today I haven't been back to Florida in years. So I, I, I haven't been back to Florida in a while, and I was living in California at the time. And the reason I decided to do the RV thing is because Instagram Live had just came out. It was brand new. And I was doing a live every every few days. And everyone was saying, I would love to meet your dogs. Come, you know, if you could, this shelter needs your help. This shelter needs your help. This shelter needs your help. 
and I thought to myself, how the hell can I, you know, I want to give the people what they want. I didn't have many followers. I had like maybe 15,000, 20,000, which at the time I thought was like, oh my God, this is so crazy. And I, I was doing a lot of my work in my friend's RV and my friend Luke's RV. So I said, as a joke, maybe I could fix this RV and come meet everybody. And as soon as I said that, I felt like, like this energy to my, like, you know, like you can't, it's just like this sign, this idea, this, this is it. I, and all of a sudden I said, what am I, this, wait, 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 on the live. I was like, wait, wait, maybe I could really do this. This is such a good idea. And that's when it started coming together, you know? And I went with my, we got the RV, which was like this beautiful, beautiful experience because I couldn't afford it. So I had a Kickstarter and we raised $40,000 and I bought this RV and I left. And I remember leaving California, um, leaving California. And I remember thinking to my, like, I, it was supposed to be a three month trip. So I didn't think that this was going to be a new start to my career. You know, I thought it was just going to be a step. And I remember looking back in the RV, seeing the dogs behind me. And I said, this is it. This is a, this is not going to be it. This isn't the next step. This is the next chapter. Right. And I ended up traveling around the country with, uh, started with seven dogs, then nine dogs, then 11 dogs. And we went all around. We went every single state, all, even all the way to Anchorage, Alaska. Wow. Yep. And it was such an experience and we got so many dogs adopted and met so many of our followers and fans. And it was just this crazy experience. You know, it, it's living in the RV, uh, that, that really sh founded and built and shaped who I am today. And started this next chapter of my life because it was living in the RV when COVID happened and I couldn't travel anymore. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, I, I was stuck for a moment until I said, no, this is happening for me, not to me. Mm -hmm. And I said, if I can't travel in an RV, I need to still impact the world. I need to still inspire people and still rescue animals. What can I do? And the idea for the animal shelter was very, very soon after that, that whole thought process. But throughout my travels, Rachel, at one time when I land, I was camping in Oregon in the RV. I was camping in Oregon. And all, it wasn't in the winter. <laughs> it, was, it was in the summer and I was like uh, speechless. You know, I couldn't believe the, the way, th how vibrant everything is, how green the, the amount of land and trees. I said, I said, the, the coast, uh, have you ever been to the Oregon coast? I have not. No, it's, it, it's, 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 you can't explain it. I mean, the rock formations and, and everything is just like, to me, I said, this is where I want to be. And it, it, the winters are really tough. You know, it's really tough. You have a lot of mud and the dogs are always wet and it's cold and it's windy. But just like you said earlier, you know, the, the pain is, for happiness to be that beautiful, you have to go through the pain for, to, for Oregon to look like the way it looks in the fall in the summer, it has to go through the, 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 the darker weather. It has to go through these times and it's worth it because it's, to me, it's the most beautiful place. And, and like, seriously, like in, in all of the U S I think Oregon is the most beautiful. Uh, we all need to go then. So talk to Absolutely. us about the, um, developing, you talked about developing the idea of the Asher house. So you're, you finally, uh, get this sanctuary. How did it become more of, um, bringing in animals to take care of them as, and give them their forever home as opposed to creating a, a, a place for you to just have dogs and other animals adopted out. How, how did I say, say, it, say it one more time? So it, it's more, Asher House is more of a place where animals can come now to live out their life, correct? As opposed to you creating a shelter for dogs to come and get adopted. Yep. Right? And was that because you had more land and you, you figured, oh, exactly. I can really take yeah. these in as a thing? There's a couple of reasons. So um, the first thing is the where we live, the county that we live when we bought the sanctuary, we weren't aware of this until after. But where we live, you're not allowed to adopt animals out from your home. Oh. You're not allowed to have a rescue from your home. 
So we decided we have an, an amazing partner called New Life Animal, uh, Family Dog New Life. We're, we're starting to uh, collaborate. So the Asher House's name is going to be in there soon. We're, we're calling it, we're going to mesh it together and call it New Life Asher House. Yeah. But for now, it's Family Dog New Life Animal Shelter. And amazing shelter in Portland. And they have it, their shelter is set up like a daycare. So there's no kennels. All the dogs are there together. So we have partnered with them. And when we bring in animals that we believe will do well with the family, we bring them that we re rehabilitate them there, get them to a certain place, and then uh, family dogs will adopt them out. But a lot of the times we take in dogs uh, and people don't see this part. And they ask, like, please adopt that dog out, adopt that dog out. But they don't realize what that dog would be like outside of the pack. Uh, the, the, the amount of dogs and the type of people that we have here is such a leading environment for most dogs. Like 99.9% .9 of dogs that come here have some sort of trauma, you know, are neglected, starved. So they have so much, so many trust issues that if they're ever put back in a similar environment, mm -hmm. right, that they were in before, it's this awful experience where they, it completely reverses everything and they just become a different, uh, back to the original type of dog that they were. So a great example is we had this dog that, you know, they warned us would bite, would warn us would, would, would uh, tear, tear everything apart. This dog was beaten and neglected and completely starved. So we don't see those characteristics. When I, when, when, when we, when I take in a dog for some reason, I have nothing but confidence that this, we can rehabilitate any dog, any living thing. We can take this animal and, and, and show him or her what love is. That's all an animal needs in order for it to not be aggressive or any of these things, right? People act out when they're in pain. Animals act out when they're in pain. Yeah. So if we feel like an animal would continue acting out outside of the sanctuary, then he or she will stay here so that people can only see the beautiful side of that animal. But if we feel like an animal, man, this dog would really thrive if it just had a mom or if it just had a dad or if it had a family where it didn't have to fight for attention, then we adopt the animal out. And it's something so beautiful because in the beginning, it was very hard for me to let go of an animal because I said to myself, like, they thrive here. I know that they're well taken care of. They get all the love, all the food. They get everything they need here. They have the pack. But up until recently, when we exceeded 50 dogs and we started adopting them out through our rescue partners, I, I hear the families, you know, with the dogs and I see the, the dogs look even happier with them than they did with me. And it brings me so much joy because it's really important to believe in people and to see the good in people. And as, as, hard, as, you, as, as hard as it is to hear the terrible stories, it makes the beautiful story so much better. You know, we just adopted out this dog, Moisha, a bloodhound puppy. It was my dream dog. You know, giving, uh, letting this dog go was like, I didn't know what was wrong with me, but I realized like everything that I do is not for a dog. I'm here to make the dog's life better. And I knew Moisha would thrive better with the family. And that's exactly what he got. And I've never seen a happier dog. Like it, it's, when, it, it's really a beautiful thing, man. It really is. But it, there's nothing like seeing dogs get adopted. I mean, it. It. I can. Yeah. I can imagine that it's so hard for you because you spent so much time with them and built a relationship with them and a chemistry. But then there's also nothing like seeing a family that really wants this dog and wants to make them a part of their life. I think that's so great. Um, so, okay, I have a bunch of questions based on yeah. being someone who, like anyone else, watches the Asher House on, on Instagram. And just, there are a million questions that go along with watching you and your story. So I'm just gonna sure. fire through a couple of them. Okay, cool. how do you- You want me to answer them quick? You want me to answer them quickly? Sure, yeah, like- Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. You don't get it, have to get into long answers. They're short questions. How do you pick okay. who deserves to be rescued? It must be so hard. Yeah, I mean, at, at this point, I, the the dynamic of the pack has a lot to do with it. Hmm. It's, it's, so it's really not about the dog we're about to rescue. It's about the dynamic of the pack and what I feel would be in a good addition to the energy of the pack. Right. So, for example, 
if if I let's say which is true last last week I rescued a really high anxiety dog really high anxiety it, it, if it has anything next to it it chews it up it's just always freaking out until I release the dog's anxiety I will not adopt another dog I will not bring another dog that matches that dog's energy or else they'll feed off each other you see what I'm saying of course. so it all depends on the dynamic of the pack and where the dogs are. That is how I decide which dog I bring in next. And how does it work with dogs getting along? I mean, I have two right now and uh, I have a little one and I have a big one and I just rescued the big one. And you know, the big one was clearly abused before we brought it home and had all these issues that we didn't really know about. And then I have my little dog that I've had since almost birth, right? So they didn't get along so well, now they do. But how does it work when in a big pack like that? So imagine, and I've never used this analogy, so be kind to me. <laughs> if you wanted to join a gang, right? And maybe there's a better word for it, but let's say there was a gang that you wanted to be a part of, okay? And the gang said, for you to be a part of our gang, you have to be okay with this, 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 and this. Mm -hmm. No, no negotiation. That's it. You're, you have to be okay with these five things. Then you enter. You're, you are now a part. You are now doing those five things. Mm. What I mean by that is when a dog comes in, we have a big pack and we operate a certain way. With a dog, right, they are pack animals. So when a dog comes into the pack, it's already set up for them. Mm. The rules are at play how the other dogs are acting and being, that dog realizes this is how I have to act and be. Why is that? Because if this dog comes into a, a gang, if this dog comes into a pack of 50 gang members mm -hmm. and he says, I'm the king, what do you think is gonna happen? Yeah, it's not gonna go over very well. They're gonna be like, fuck that. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I can tell rebellion, you. Rebellion, right? yeah. So they get, so it's that, you know, they say we're a product, we're a, we're a product of the people we spend time with, right? It's the same for animals. The animal, you could have the nicest chihuahua in the world, but if you put that chihuahua with 10 really feisty chihuahuas, that chihuahua is going to end up being an asshole as well. Right. It has, it's about, it's about putting that dog in a better environment. That's why I'm always so confident. Like I just did this rescue video and a lot of people commented, because the owner said, please tell me if it doesn't work out. They always like to act like they give a shit. Please tell me if it doesn't work out. I said, trust me, it's going to work out, right? And a lot of people commented, how did you know it was going to work out? You don't even know the dog. I know it's going to work out because that dog is now my dog. Yeah. That dog is coming into my path. And that's how I know it's going to work out. You see what I mean by that? Yeah, a hundred percent. How do you get these dogs? This question my daughter brought up to me this morning because she loves you also. Um, oh. How do you get the dogs to trust you? Because you're going into an environment, you're seeing a dog who's super scared or abused or hasn't lived with someone because they've lived on the street for a while. How do you get them to actually trust you before you take them to the pack, but trust you personally? Rachel, I got to tell you something, you know, you are really beautiful at asking good questions you know how to ask a question like you you ask the important stuff you can ask a lot of stuff with what i do you ask the good questions and you you're patient with me you're really like a pro i want you to know i oh, really am enjoying it. it's Just really beautiful <laughs> and tell your daughter tell your daughter that's such a good question right it, it goes back to your previous question of how do all the dogs get along so well mm -hmm. I, I, I know, right, that there isn't a situation that's going to make me feel like this was a mistake. Okay. The dog can feel that from me. Mm -hmm. So the dog doesn't think if I do this, he will hit me. If I do this, he will put me away. If I do this, he's going to get mad. The dog knows this guy has my back. He could feel it with my energy. He can feel it with the way or she, with the way that I pet her, with the way that I hold her close. This, this guy isn't like the others, mm -hmm. right? It's, it is my natural instinct for me as a human to protect people. I'm, I'm a big protector. I always, because I was bullied so bad, 
I have this natural instinct to protect the weak. So when I bring in a new dog, if you were to visualize it, you, like I take the dog and I'm holding him behind my back so that he or she can see behind, in front, can see, but I'm, I'm the guardian, I'm the protector. And they can feel that, you know, it's the way that I carry them, the way that I hold them, the way that I don't, I don't hold their stories accountable. Mm -hmm. For example, when I bring in a dog, I treat that dog as if it was born that day. It's a new day. And, and I really believe that they can feel that mm -hmm. I, they, it's just like, you know, I think the best thing about dogs is their instincts. Although sometimes, you know, it happens where a dog has bit someone innocent and things like that, but the dog usually it's all out of fear. Mm -hmm. So I take away all of the fear, you know, I, I, that is my objective. When I meet a dog and say, like, you're not going to fear me. Right. If that makes sense. You know? 100%. And, 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 it, and it goes with experience, Rachel. Like I don't want people to think to themselves, oh, I wish I didn't. I wish I was like that. It's like you do anything every day for, for, for the amount of time that I do it. It's like you're going to become, you, if you spend every, you, you see these people with lions and you see them wrestling the lions, you know, at the, at the sanctuaries, not the circus bullshit. Uh -huh. But you see these guys at the sanctuaries wrestling lions and hyenas and they're, playing hide and seek it's no different than what i do with dogs it's like these guys live with the lions they sleep with the lions they eat with the lion they are the the lion looks at them as they are a lion they don't look at them as this is a lion the dogs view me as the the pack leader a dog you know i we can communicate without communicating all 90 percent of dogs will communicate non-verbally so you learn that language you learn what they're feeling before they have to express it and it's just this connection, this energetic connection, right. you know? Right. Have there any, any time been, I mean, cause I know even with people and their personality, sometimes you get a bad egg or you're, you know, you, you think one thing about someone and they're either really mentally ill in a different way, right? Has there ever yeah. been a dog that's come in that you haven't been able to rehabilitate that you've had to send elsewhere or that you have to keep away from the pack um, and cannot introduce them at all, and they live somewhere else? So, I've had dogs, I've had dogs where I'll bring them into the pack, and everything is great, mm -hmm. and, and it was going really well, and, sorry, my parrot is here behind me. I see, see so cute. And, and everything was great, and then once they got comfortable in the pack, they said, you know, I think I want to be the pack leader. Hmm. and the pack isn't okay with that the pack doesn't want that hmm. so i will then have to uh spend a lot more time next to that dog hmm. I, right like really close to that dog you see me when i'm out i never use a leash and things like that hmm. i will start leashing that dog and that's my way of saying you're not you're not the pack leader right and then of course eventually they will they will let it goes away. So dogs, just like children, will always test you. They'll always see what they can get away with eventually. They'll try new things. And sometimes you just bring them back to day one, hmm. right? But never from the beginning, right off the bat, has there been like, oh, this isn't going to work out, you know? Right. Never. Animal rescue is such a difficult um, job, business. Has there ever been a time that you have wanted to quit since you started on this mission? Every couple, I'm not joking, like every few days. Wow. Yeah, I consider it every few days. And what keeps you going or not, you know, not stepping out of the game? I'm being, because it's a selfish thought. Mm. So if I do that, everything, all the pain, all the tears, all the loss, the death, all the tragedy, the trauma, all the successes, even all of it was, was bullshit if I do that. Mm. It all became selfish. Because I've never, no one ever quits, because no one quits basketball or any sport because it's too hard for a teammate, you know, it's because of them. And if I quit, it's because of how I feel or something happening to me. And it's a selfish, it's okay to be self, it's okay to have selfish thoughts. Mm -hmm. It's different for the action, right? Mm -hmm. You can't control your thoughts, you can control your action. I often want to quit, you know, it, for what I do at, at this level, 
um, it's not the dogs, it's the people that make it really tough for me, Rachel. You know, going back to like feeling misunderstood, I'll post something and people like completely, you know, didn't understand what I was trying to say. Mm -hmm. Like you have to almost try to be perfect, which, you know, you're, you, I, I, if I keep the animals, people say you're hoarding dogs. If I get the animals adopted, they call me a piece of shit for showing the dog a sanctuary, then adopting it out. You can't make everybody happy. There's a lot of pressure, you know, um, and I, I was going to ask you about it because you must get so many emails, calls, whatever it is about, you have to take this animal. And there's only so many. No animals. exaggeration between two to 300 a day, right. two to 300 per day. Right. And you know what some of them say, Rachel, if you don't take this dog, I'm going to euthanize it. Ugh. Wow. That's about 10 to 15 a day. Yeah. Pathetic people, you know, I'm tired of it. Sure. Like, I don't want us. I don't want the emails. I don't want the negativity, like you think you get to a certain place where you don't have to deal with it. And, you know, I, I just didn't structure my life that way, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. Um, do people help you? You look like you're doing it all alone from watching your Instagram. It looks like just you. I mean, there's gotta be other help there, yeah? I have help um, Monday through Friday from seven to three. Wow, that doesn't seem like a lot. How are you doing it all on your own? I mean, I have two dogs and it makes me yeah. like a mess. It's like, you know, I'm trying to figure out how to get them to be doing things so they're not bored. I mean, I know you have this amazing property to walk them all over the place. Right. But yeah. The, entertaining the dogs isn't, isn't the hard part. But yeah, <laughs> look, like, I'm, you know, I have a system down, but it's not, it's not, a, I, I think I do a bad job sometimes because I make, I think I make it look very easy on social media. I don't really know how to make it look difficult. I'm not one that films something difficult. Like, I don't know, do I, do people want to see me picking up six pounds of dog shit in my living room? Like, I don't know what people, you know what I mean? So it's like, you know, a lot of my stuff is, is washing the dogs, cleaning up the dogs, feeding the dogs. And it's like, mm. it's tough, you know, I, I, and I'm now I'm, I'm at this stage now. So look, not too long ago, Rachel, Whenever I left the responsibilities to someone else, something would go wrong. Right. I totally understand that. Yeah. And it really hurt me, like really hurt me because it made me feel a guilty for giving someone else the responsibility and B that I will never have freedom. Yeah. Yeah. So I am now in the process of accepting whatever happens. If something goes wrong, I know it's on me and I have to be willing to whether clean up the mess literally or grieve, God forbid. And then I have to make an announcement, you know, to what, 3 million people on Facebook and a million on Instagram and all these other people. It's like, I have to have the weight and the judgment, but you know what? Like you have to let go. Mm -hmm. You, 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 you. At the end of the day, you realize you can't, I realize like I cannot sustain if I do this myself long-term. I, I look in the mirror and I say, like, I don't recognize the, the face. Like I, I have pictures of, of, of like collages of, on my walls um, of when I started the Asher house with certain dogs that had passed away. And it's like, man, you would think that was 20 years ago. You know, it's just a couple of years ago, three years ago. So I, I know that I need to, I need to, um, you know, have some, hire, yeah, hire more people and trust people to do this for me. And that's the stage I'm at in my life now is not just from seven to three, but you know, I, I don't have any help on the weekends. It's just me. So I'm, I'm going to start, uh, working, you know, I'm, I'm not start. I've already started working on myself to let go of more and more responsibilities and start focusing on myself more. That's, right. I think, you know how we talked about next chapters? Mm -hmm. This next chapter for me is focusing on the Asher, um, not more than, but just as much as focusing on the Asher house. Right. Hey everyone, thanks for listening to part one of this amazing interview with Lee Asher. There's so much more. Tune in next time for part two. You are not gonna wanna miss it. 
Thanks for joining us. And please make sure you subscribe. If you like the show, give us five stars, write a review, anything you can to help us in that way. We really appreciate it.